Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Nora Fernandez sat at home when suddenly a call came. The old woman picked up the phone, and in the same moment, she heard the voice of a woman she had recently met. The caller greeted the homeowner and asked for permission to come over. Nora Fernandez was surprised, but didn't express it and said she won't mind her to come in. And now, Elvira Velasco sits with the old woman in the living room, holding a cup of fragrant coffee in her hands. The homeowner at that moment asks the young woman, As I understand you didn't come to me out of idle curiosity? I understand that my visit is unexpected for you. I wanted to talk to you during my first visit, but I couldn't because I had urgent matters to attend to. I have already heard about your fate, but I would like to know everything firsthand, as they say, from you. And the main question, why did you act that way with your children? Elvira whispered, Why do you need to know that? The elderly woman nervously fidgeted with her handkerchief. I came from the city to your village, which means I really need to know. But if it's difficult for you to talk about it, I won't insist, the guest replied. Well, if you're really interested, I can tell you everything. But it won't be a short story. I have plenty of time, and you correctly noted that I really need to know your story. After all, we will be seeing each other frequently soon, Elvira said. The old woman looked at the guest with a sad gaze, and then wiped her eyes with a handkerchief. And only after that, she began her narrative. Nora was born in the village. She was the only child in the family. Nora's father died when she was 15 years old. After her husband's death, Nora's mother didn't form any new relationships and lived for her daughter. Nora's first love was a boy who was a year older than her. Even then, the girl realized that her beloved would become the meaning of her life. So, when they had been dating for three months, she told him, If you ever want to leave me, I won't survive it. Like my mother, if I love, it's for a lifetime. So let's promise each other that we'll always be together and never betray our love. Why do you have such sad thoughts? Of course, we will be together and die on the same day, but only in old age, said the boy named Gautier. Nora shared this conversation with her friend Margarita, who was in the same class as her. Her friend listened with a smirk and sarcastically remarked that they were still at an age when there are a hundred infatuations. Nora looked at her friend reproachfully and replied that there was only one love for her, and that was her love for Gautier. When Nora was finishing school, she unexpectedly realized that she was pregnant. She immediately understood when it happened. She had visited her boyfriend in the compulsory military and spent the night with him, giving her first time to him. Nora was happy about it, but didn't know how to break the news to her mother, who often threatened to kick her out of the house if she got pregnant before turning 18. Nora knew she wouldn't be able to hide the pregnancy for long, as her belly would soon start showing, and her mother would inevitably notice. She was nervous about it, and her friend noticed, prompting her to ask directly, You haven't been yourself lately. Maybe you want to share? I'll tell you everything, but you promise not to tell anyone. Right now, I just need advice, and I don't know who to turn to, Nora said. Then she informed her friend about her pregnancy and what her mother had said about it. In response, Margarita laughed and said, All moms say things like that, but when faced with the fact, they don't kick their own child out of the house. I won't hide the fact that your mother will grumble a little at first, lecture you, and that will be the end of it. So, you don't have to be afraid and can tell your mother about your pregnancy. If I were in your place, I would be more concerned about how your beloved will react to this. I understand that you haven't told him anything yet. He doesn't know anything, but we have talked about it. Gautier said that if I get pregnant, I will have the baby, Nora whispered quietly. After that conversation, several months passed. Nora's mother indeed noticed her daughter's growing belly. She immediately accused Nora of leading a promiscuous lifestyle. Nora tried to justify herself to her mother, explaining that she loved her young man and that he had no intention of abandoning her. Nora had to endure many reprimands on the matter. After the moral lectures, her mother naturally forgave her daughter and didn't kick her out. Nora breathed a sigh of relief once her mother found out. 
Now she just had to wait for the army guy, as he had been informed about the pregnancy, and they could formalize their relationship. That same day Norov called Gatir, and he learned that his beloved was expecting his child, he proposed to her. After some time, Gatir returned from the military, and the young couple married soon after. After the wedding, they decided to live in Nora's house, and they had a daughter named Agueda. Nora joyfully embraced her maternal responsibilities, finding immense pleasure in taking care of the little one. Time passed, and soon Agueda turned two years old. Nora was already thinking about sending her daughter to daycare so she could find work, but then she realized she was pregnant again. She shared this news with her spouse, with whom she shared a deep connection. She waited for her husband to return from work and quietly told him, Gatir, I'm pregnant again. I'm not particularly happy about this news, the head of the family said. Are you suggesting that I should consider terminating the pregnancy? Nora said incredulously, expecting a different reaction from her beloved. Listen, in our time, having two children is a true luxury. You understand that my wages as a laborer at the sugar factory are only enough for food and utilities. We're fortunate that your mother helps us. Otherwise, we would barely make ends meet. So, now you have to decide, do we need another child? Her husband spoke, revealing his true feelings about the news. I can't believe you're saying this to me. We dreamed of having at least three children together, and now you're talking about money shortage. Nora almost cried, expressing her disappointment. Do as you wish. I've told you my opinion, the man said, and then he demonstratively left the house, making it clear to his wife that he had no intention of revisiting this conversation. As soon as Gatir left, Nora, feeling tired, sank into the armchair. She realized that they had just had their first argument since their wedding day. Nora had really wanted another child, but she didn't know how to handle Gatir's opinion. She decided to seek advice from her friend and called her. Her friend picked up the phone right away and began rapidly talking about her studies. She was currently living in a different city, studying accounting. Nora patiently listened to Margarita and wished her friend would pause and give her a chance to speak. However, the conversation partner had no intention of stopping. Frustrated, Nora spoke in an elevated tone. How much longer are you going to chatter? I'm pregnant. Oh, congratulations, exclaimed her friend. I'm also overjoyed about this event, but my spouse is against having a second child. And I don't know what to do. I just know that this time I'm sure it will be a boy, the young woman said. Well, I can't advise you on that. You have to make the decision yourself. Perhaps your fiancé is just not ready to become a father again, Margarita hesitantly replied. What do you think? If I decide to continue with the pregnancy without my husband's agreement, will we have disagreements later on? Oh, you're a peculiar one. I believe you're Gatir's wife, not me. Therefore, it's up to you to decide what awaits you in this case, Margarita responded. After the conversation with her friend, Nora pondered, and when her spouse came home, she decided to bring up the topic again. However, Gatir tactfully asked his wife not to start that conversation, adding that he had already expressed his opinion, and Nora should make the decision herself. And so, the woman made up her mind to go through with the pregnancy and informed her husband. Gatir shrugged in response and didn't say anything further on the matter. Time continued to pass. Nora soon found out that she was indeed expecting a boy. She hurried to share the news with her beloved, thinking that he would be pleased about having an heir. However, she was met with disappointment as her husband only nodded and remained silent. In due time, Nora gave birth to a boy whom they named Constantino. The young woman was ecstatic, believing that she had an ideal marriage and a model family. However, just a month after their son's birth, Nora realized that things weren't as perfect as she thought. It happened when the baby fell ill. Both Nora and the baby were hospitalized, and she spent two weeks in the hospital. During that time, her husband visited her infrequently, which hurt Nora deeply. After her discharge, she noticed that her husband often stayed out late. The young woman demanded an explanation, but Gatir simply brushed her off. 
It was at that moment that Nora thought her husband had found another woman and confronted him directly. The head of the family became angry at this accusation and uttered, What on earth makes you think that? Don't you have anything else to do besides fantasizing? But you've become as cold as ice in bed. And what do you suggest I think? You're always staying late at work. I'm a living person too, and you should take me into account. You've changed in such a short period of time, even my mother noticed it. His wife spoke, trying not to burst into tears. Don't be dramatic, please. I don't have anyone else. Let's talk about your mother's savings instead. We should ask her to give us that money. I've been telling you for a while that I want to buy a car. You should talk to your mother about it and ask for the funds. Then we can buy a car. We can't save up the money ourselves, you know, the man said. The young woman could only nod obediently in response to Gautier. And that was the end of their conversation. After that conversation, Nora felt a heavy weight on her soul, but she didn't know how to change the situation. As per her husband's request, she approached her mother, but her mother replied that those finances were meant for a rainy day and she had no intention of spending them. Some time passed, and Margarita came to the village after finishing her studies. On the same day, she visited Nora and immediately noticed that her friend was feeling down. Margarita gave Nora a serious look and said in a business-like tone, I don't understand something. Aren't you glad to see me? Don't talk nonsense. I've been waiting for your return. It's just that things aren't going well between my husband and me, and that's why I feel terrible. I have a feeling that he's tempted by another woman. I've tried to talk to him about it several times, but Gatir always avoids giving a straight answer, Nora whispered. And here I thought you knew everything about your fiancé. My mother told me that she frequently sees your husband accompanied by a charming blonde. I don't know what kind of relationship they have, but it's definitely not friendly. I didn't want to discuss it over the phone. I thought you would bring it up yourself. But you didn't tell me anything, her friend replied. I didn't want to burden you with my problems. Can you tell me where exactly your mother saw Gautier with this woman? Nora asked in a muffled voice, feeling like she might burst into tears in front of her friend. The young woman now clearly understood that all this time her husband had been blatantly lying to her, and he did indeed have a lover. Margarita said she would ask her mother for details and would call Nora later that evening to share everything. Then the guest asked what Nora would do if Gautier really had a lover. However, no answer followed because Nora couldn't hold back her tears. Margarita embraced her and softly said, Don't cry, go see a fortune teller and perform a magical ritual instead. Many people are getting rid of their mistresses that way. There's an old woman in the neighboring village who specializes in this. They say she can do impossible things. Just make sure not to tell your husband about it. Rituals are always done in secret. Soon Margarita left, and later that evening she called Nora and told her where her mother often saw Gautier with the blonde woman. Nora asked her mother to watch the children and rush to the given address. Nora already knew that if she saw her husband, she wouldn't be able to hold back and would confront him in front of his companion. And indeed, she saw her husband walking next to the attractive blonde woman, happily telling her something. The couple then approached the house with a large walnut tree. They hid behind the tree trunk to avoid prying eyes. Nora immediately imagined that Gautier would start kissing the blonde woman. Unable to bear it, she ran towards the walnut tree to find out what was happening. Nora arrived behind the tree at the exact moment her husband was about to kiss the woman. Nora immediately shouted at Gautier in anger, accusing him of infidelity. Then she turned her attention to the blonde woman and said, How dare you? He has two little children. Don't you have enough single men around? Shameless face of yours. I'll tear you apart right now. With these words, Nora intended to grab the stranger by the hair, but her path was blocked by her husband, who sternly said, Don't cause a scene here. Do you want people to witness your quarrels? Go home now, and I'll be back later. Are you out of your mind? You are pushing away your lawful wife and planning to stand here with this tramp? 
I'm not going anywhere. Let people hear that you, a deceitful womanizer, are fooling around. Nora said, raising her voice. The man took his wife by the hand and led her away, telling the blonde woman that he would call her later. Nora tried to free her hand to slap the stranger, but Gautier held her tightly and only pushed her forward to leave this place as soon as possible. Once the couple arrived home, Nora couldn't contain her anger and began yelling at her husband. She called him a betrayer, a cheater, a scoundrel. Nora's mother observed all of this without saying a word. After listening to his wife's shouts for a while, Gautier irritably said, Maybe that's enough of stirring up the air? Yes, I have a woman now, and I love her. She came here briefly to visit her grandmother, and in a week, Sandra will have to go back. And since you already found out about her, I want to tell you that I want a divorce. And don't make a mountain out of a molehill right now. Love fades away in life, it happens. That's what happened to me. You're still young, and you'll find yourself another man. Nora stood in silence, unable to believe what her own husband had just told her. She thought he would apologize to her and talk about making an irreversible mistake. But instead, she heard Gautier wanting to leave her and go to that blonde woman. Nora stood stunned for a while, then couldn't hold back and burst into tears. Her husband didn't try to console her and left the house. Nora's mother approached her and gently stroked her head like a little child. This touch made her cry even harder. It went on for a few minutes, and only then did her mother say to Nora, Stop crying. Let him go wherever he wants. You and I will raise your children together. I'm not that old yet. I'll continue working. And when Constantino turns two, we'll send him to daycare, and you'll find a job for yourself. Mom, I don't want this divorce. I love Gautier and want to be with him. Let that tramp go away, and maybe he'll forget about her. Everything will be fine between us, just like before. Nora said through sobs, still believing that she could change everything in this situation. But only on the condition that the other woman had to leave. After that, Nora remembered her friend's advice to visit a fortune teller. She turned to her mother and asked for money. Her mother looked at her with a sad expression when she found out what the funds were needed for. She quietly said that love couldn't be conjured. However, Nora burst into tears again, pleading to give her the money. The homeowner sighed sorrowfully and promised to withdraw the funds from the bank and give them to her tomorrow. Nora joyfully hugged her mother in response, firmly believing that the fortune teller in the neighboring village would definitely help her. Soon Gautier arrived and deliberately made a bed for himself in the living room. Nora tried to be affectionate with her husband, but he simply ignored her. She didn't know how to attract her beloved and tried to have another conversation with him, but this time without shouting or insults. Nora spoke up. Darling, you can't just take off and leave me like that. We're meant for each other. I understand that you might be going through some stress, and you looked at this woman. But now she will leave, and we will start everything anew, as if this troublemaker never existed. I promise you, I will never bring it up again. What a fool you are. I have already made a decision, and I can say more. I'm quitting my job. Now please leave me alone. Don't make me say something rude to you, her husband said irritably. The young woman clenched her teeth to refrain from shouting again and meekly left the room for the children's room. Only there did she quietly cry from hurt and humiliation. However, Nora still cherished the last chance that she could keep her husband with the help of a magical ritual. The next day, she eagerly awaited her mother from the bank, and as soon as she received the money, she approached the neighbor to drive her to the neighboring village and wait there. The pensioner agreed to fulfill Nora's request for a certain fee. In no time, the young woman was sitting in the presence of a fortune teller known in the area as Estella. The old woman attentively listened to the guest, then asked to give her hand. Nora extended her hand and anxiously watched as the hostess examined her palm. Estella gazed at the palm for a few minutes, then spoke. I will help you, but you don't need it. He will leave you anyway, but temporarily. I will give you the instructions for the ritual that you will perform yourself. Follow them exactly as I instruct, 
Don't tell anyone about the ritual, not even your own mother. I will do everything as you say. Nora fervently exclaimed and immediately asked another question. Why did you say that I don't need it? The old woman looked thoughtfully at her visitor and slowly said, On your palm, I saw that your destinies intertwine but then diverge. I cannot tell you more. And now I will tell you how to perform the ritual and give you a sheet with the incantation. Estella leisurely explained to the young woman how to conduct the ritual. Afterward, the old woman wrote the text of the spell on a notebook page and handed it to Nora. Nora took out the money and handed it to the homeowner. Estella nodded approvingly and wished her guest all the best. Nora returned home in an uplifted mood. She knew that tomorrow she would perform a sacred ritual and everything would be fine with her husband. Later that evening, her friend called and inquired about Gatir's mistress. Nora confirmed that her husband indeed had a lover. Margarita, upon hearing this, immediately asked, What are you going to do in this situation? I can't tell you everything, but you'll understand me. Well, I went to Estella, and the rest you can imagine. In any case, I won't let that blonde take my husband without a fight, the interlocutor firmly stated. Well, that's something. As for me and my character, I wouldn't forgive infidelity. It makes me sick just imagining my beloved person kissing someone else, Margarita replied. You haven't experienced true love yet, that's why you say that. When you meet someone who you can't imagine life without, you'll speak differently, sadly spoke the friend. On the appointed day, at midnight, Nora performed the ritual in complete solitude. She followed the ritual exactly as Estella had instructed. Only after that did the young woman, feeling relieved, go to rest. Nearly a month passed, and Gatir kept himself apart all this time. He slept in a separate room from his wife and rejected all her attempts to reconcile. This deeply hurt Nora, but she endured it because she didn't want to escalate the situation further. Nora's mother observed all of this and disapproved of her daughter's behavior. Soon, Gatir announced that he was leaving and began packing his belongings. Nora watched in horror at her husband's actions. She remembered what Estella had told her about him leaving temporarily and then returning. However, Nora didn't expect this departure. It was a true shock for her. The woman grabbed Gatir's hands, then got down on her knees and tearfully spoke. Please, don't leave, don't abandon me. I can't imagine how I'll live without you. I'm willing to do anything as long as you're by my side. Don't humiliate yourself. Get up from your knees right now. Get up from your knees. I can't stand to see it. We've already talked about this. I'll file for divorce later, once our son turns one. When I find work in the city, I'll send a certain amount of money. Spend the money only for its intended purpose, namely on the children, the man said. Nora realized that at the moment, no words would be able to keep her husband. She silently rose from her knees and sat down in a chair. All she wanted now was for Gautier to change his mind, stay with her and the children. But she understood that it was impossible. After Gautier's departure, Nora walked around like a sleepwalker. She mechanically picked up her daughter from daycare, cooked meals at home, and tidied up the house. Nora's mother tried to distract her from bitter thoughts, but her attempts were in vain. Margarita, who often visited, also noticed that her friend was deeply distressed by Gautier's departure. During every meeting, Margarita would say, Stop moping around. It would be better to take a walk around the village with the children one more time than sit and wither over a picture of the traitor. It's been so long, and he hasn't even contacted you. Hasn't he asked how his children are doing? And you're exhausting yourself because of him. Look at how much weight you've lost. It's frightening. Rita, don't speak ill of Gatir. It's probably my fault that he found another woman on the side, Nora responded bitterly. You're the one talking nonsense now. Your womanizer Gatir couldn't care less about you. And don't try to convince me that he's a good person. Let's talk about something else, or I'll explode right now. Margarita spoke out. Six months passed since Gatir left. Nora still waited for her beloved, but she was no longer in the same state as when her husband abandoned her. 
The young woman started to smile more often again and took the children out for walks. Both Nora's mother and Margarita were happy to see the changes in her. They thought that Nora had finally forgotten about Gautier. However, Margarita soon realized that she was mistaken. During a conversation between them, Nora unexpectedly said, You know, maybe I'll never get married again, as I've realized that I'm a monogamist. Are you saying that you're still waiting for Gautier? You're insane, I swear. You'll meet someone who will value and respect you, Margarita replied. The tear will reappear in my life, that's what the fortune teller told me, and that's why I'm waiting for him, Nora quietly responded. And indeed, Gautier showed up completely unexpectedly. It happened when Constantino was seven months old. He arrived with a huge bouquet of flowers, a doll for their daughter, and a toy car for their son. Nora opened the door herself and, without saying a word, let him into the house. Gautier smiled and asked if they were happy to see him or not. The young woman nodded and continued to gaze at her beloved. Then her husband approached and embraced her, followed by a kiss on the lips. Nora immediately decided that she wouldn't ask him anything. She was simply glad that he had returned. Unlike her daughter, her mother-in-law greeted him without much joy. The hostess of the apartment harbored a dislike for this man and didn't try to hide it. When Margarita learned about it, she told Nora that she was crazy to forgive such a scoundrel. Meanwhile, the young woman was happy because her beloved husband was once again by her side. Gautier didn't explain anything to his wife about why he returned to the family. He behaved as if he hadn't left for another woman. And Nora was fine with that because she didn't want to know all the intricacies of her husband's relationship with the blonde. Soon Gautier found a new job, and life smoothly continued. Nora warmly welcomed her husband and tried to be friendly with him. She now cherished each day. Three months passed since Gautier returned to the family. One day, he came home from work looking pensive. Nora immediately noticed that something was bothering him. She looked at Gautier questioningly and was about to ask a question when he softly spoke. Let's sit down and have a calm conversation now. Let's agree from the start that we won't use fancy words and you won't blame me for anything. In short, Sandra called me today and asked me to come back. And I am planning to do that. Understand that I still love this woman and I can't help it. I realize that once again I'm causing you pain, but that's how it turned out. Nora looked at her husband with disbelief for a while, feeling nauseous. She couldn't believe that the situation was repeating itself, and once again, that detestable Sandra was taking her beloved husband away. As soon as Nora regained her composure, she quietly said, Are you saying that you came back to me only because that blonde woman kicked you out? Yes, that's right. Sandra and I had a big fight, and she showed me the door. What else could I do? So, I called my classmate in the village and found out that you were still alone. That's why I decided to mend the broken vase and try to start fresh with you. But as you can see, it didn't work out, Gautier said. How could you do this to me and the children? How can you go back to that woman after sharing a bed with me? I don't understand you, and I realize that no rational arguments will stop you. His wife said tearfully, the man didn't say anything in response. He silently began packing his things. At that moment, Nora's mother returned home and saw her crying daughter and her son-in-law packing a bag. The house owner immediately understood the situation and angrily addressed the man. This is the last time you're leaving here. Even if Nora forgives you and wants to take you back, I won't let you in. I've never seen such a scoundrel before. Soon, Gautier left. He didn't say anything to his wife before leaving. Nora felt crushed, once again losing herself in despair. Her mother scolded her for her weakness, but the daughter didn't respond. She didn't feel like talking to anyone. Even when her friend came over, she asked her not to bring up the topic of Gautier. Time moved on, and slowly Nora began to recover after her husband's departure. Deep down, she still held on to hope that her beloved would return. She didn't share her hope with anyone, she pretended that everything was fine. When Constantino turned two years old, 
Nora enrolled him in daycare and started working at the boiler house. Margarita scolded her friend for taking such a difficult job. Nora replied that they paid well here. She consciously chose to work at the boiler house because she and her mother were struggling financially at the time. Gautier hadn't sent them any money, despite his promises. Soon, Margarita got married. Nora was happy for her friend, who finally found her own happiness. And shortly after, her friend told Nora that she would soon become a mother. When Constantino turned three years old, Nora's mother suddenly passed away from a heart attack. The young woman struggled to cope with the loss of her mother. She knew that from now on, she would have to rely solely on her own strength and not expect any help from anyone else. Immediately after the funeral, Nora decided to talk to her friend. As soon as Margarita arrived, the young woman spoke up. I know that you're already a married woman and will soon become a mother yourself. And I know you have plenty of your own problems, but still, I'm willing to ask for your help. You see, I work shifts at the boiler house, as you know. And I can't manage my time properly to pick up or drop off the children from daycare. So, can I ask you to do it for me when I can't? Don't worry, I'll pay you for it. Well, not much, but still. I can't afford to lose this job, they pay well there. Are you an idiot or pretending to be one? Why would you even think about paying me? Of course, I'll pick up your kids from daycare. I'll just have to come to your place earlier when you have a morning shift. But you know, I think you should consider changing your job. Not all men there can handle themselves, and it might jeopardize your health. Besides, you're still young and attractive, Margarita said. Everything is fine. I'm used to it there already. Thank you so much for your help. I was struggling to figure out what to do with the kids. Although, when you give birth, I don't know how I'll solve this problem. After all, you'll have a little one. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves, Nora replied. Soon, Margarita gave birth to her child, and Nora made arrangements with their neighbor, Leonila, who was a housewife and had four kids of her own. Leonila willingly agreed to look after Nora's children, pick them up from daycare, and bring them back home. Nora understood that if Margarita didn't charge her for this service because they were friends, she still needed to pay Leonila at least some amount. So Nora immediately discussed the payment with Leonila, and it turned out to be a reasonable sum, which pleased the woman. Time passed slowly, and Nora was getting ready to send her daughter, Agueda, to elementary school. She watched the little girl and admired her. In that moment, she thought about how much Agueda resembled her father. Nora often reminisced about Gautier, and when the children were asleep, she would look at his photo and cry. She continued to wait for him. Then, Nora's friend came to visit with her son. Margarita wanted to have a serious conversation with Nora about her life. She placed a small cake on the table and asked Nora to pour some coffee. Nora chuckled and said, You're not exactly a stranger here. You could have done it yourself. Don't be difficult. I just want to feel like a guest today, not like the host. Listen, how long are you going to be consumed by work and the kids? It's time to think about yourself. Besides your boiler job, you don't see or know anything else, said Margarita. What exactly have I missed? Nora asked with a smile. Don't play innocent. You know exactly what I'm talking about. My fiancé's friend over there has been asking about you more than once. Shall we arrange a meeting for you too? Maybe you'll create a family? And you can give him more children? What do you think of my proposal? Margarita mysteriously spoke as she had long wanted to introduce her friend to her husband's friend. Calm down, I'm asking you. Are you trying to be a matchmaker? It doesn't suit you. I already told you that I love only one person, so your admirer doesn't interest me at all. And if you keep bringing it up, I'll give you a spoon on the forehead. The homeowner said seriously. Do you really think about Gautier after all this time? Margarita asked incredulously. Not only do I think about him, but, to be honest, I still wait for him and love him, Nora quietly replied. 
Margarita realized that it made no sense to discuss potential suitors and changed the subject to school. She asked if Nora had everything prepared for school. The host proudly showed the school uniform and fancy shoes she had bought for her daughter. Time continued to pass, and the end of Agueda's first year in school was approaching. Nora was waiting for her daughter from school, and to her surprise, she saw her entering with a man. She looked at the man and was astonished. It was Gautier. Nora didn't know what to say. She glanced at her daughter, who exclaimed with joy, Mommy, I'm not alone. I brought Daddy. He met me near the school and said he's my dad. How do you like our surprise? Gautier gently patted the girl's head and then looked at his wife. He could see that she was shocked by his sudden appearance, so he waited for her to speak first. Nora took a while to recover from the shock. She had so many questions for the man she had been waiting for all this time, and now he appeared out of the blue. Unable to endure the long silence, Gautier spoke up. Aren't you going to say anything? What am I supposed to say? For example, that you're happy to see your beloved person, Gautier said with a smile. Don't play games. Tell me, why are you here? I came back to my family. I have children here, the man said. Nora asked her daughter to go to her room and not interrupt the conversation between adults. Agueda didn't object and obeyed her mother's request. Meanwhile, as soon as they were alone, Gautier quickly approached his wife, embraced her, and passionately kissed her on the lips. In that moment, Nora felt that she no longer cared about the reasons or intentions behind her husband's sudden appearance. She only wanted one thing, to be kissed by Gautier. After a while, Gautier released her and affectionately declared that he had come back for good and would never leave again. Nora wanted to ask a question but then changed her mind since her husband had stated that he came back for good. There was no point in digging up the past. Margarita found out about Gautier's arrival and immediately called her friend, scolding her. Nora listened to Margarita with a smile. It didn't matter to her what the other person had to say. What mattered was that her beloved was by her side. Meanwhile, Margarita sarcastically said, He came, hugged you, kissed you, and you forgave him everything? Yes? Where is your pride? Where is the guarantee that he won't disappear again in a couple of weeks? What if that same blonde woman calls him and he tells you, Sorry, dear, but my love is not for you. And he disappears again for a couple of years. Think before it's too late or you'll be crying bitter tears. Stop preaching to me. Instead, be happy for your friend that she has found happiness again. You can't even imagine how happy I am right now. I don't have words to describe what's happening in my soul. Margarita happily exclaimed. Eventually, Gautier and his wife had a conversation. Nora asked her husband if he was certain that he would never leave her and the children again. The man laughed and replied that he now belonged only to her. He also mentioned that he would be working on a rotational basis. Nora frowned and asked why he couldn't return to his previous job. Gautier explained that the earnings were relatively low compared to the city. Then he asked about Nora's mother's savings. This question made Nora slightly suspicious, but she immediately scolded herself for the negative thoughts and answered that only half of the money remained and she didn't touch that sum. Gautier didn't ask any more questions on the matter, which pleased Nora. A month had passed since the head of the family returned. Nora was glowing with happiness. Even Margarita noticed that her friend had blossomed, saying directly to her, Although I don't trust your wayward husband, his return has indeed been beneficial for you. I didn't expect you to change so drastically overnight. Just be careful that Gautier doesn't hurt you again. A couple of weeks later, Gautier brought up the topic of his imminent departure for work. Nora was saddened by the news and tried to persuade her husband to change his job. However, Gautier rejected the suggestion, then lovingly embraced his wife and said, I'll be away for only a month. I promise to call you frequently and inquire about your well-being. You won't even have a chance to miss me before I'm back to kiss and embrace you again. I already miss you, and you haven't even left yet, his wife replied. Well, that's good. 
It means our reunion will be passionate in a month's time. You know, my love, I want to talk about money. Could you lend me some for a month? I'll repay you as soon as I return from work. Just don't ask me why I need the money. I want to surprise you. Do you trust me? The man affectionately spoke. But I keep that money for emergencies, just like my mother did before. I don't know what to say to this request. Okay, forget it. I'll figure it out on my own, the man said and silently left the living room for the kitchen. Wait, all right, I'll give you the money tomorrow, but you promise to return it. The woman said, realizing that her husband's mood had soured after her initial refusal. As soon as Gatir heard that his wife would give him the money, he immediately returned to her, embraced her, and softly thanked her in her ear. Nora didn't ask why he needed the sum, she trusted him completely. Shortly after, Gatir left. As promised, Nora gave him her late mother's savings. On parting, Gatir promised to call every other day and asked his wife to remain faithful. Nora laughed at the statement and said that she didn't need anyone else besides him. Several days passed and Gatir didn't call. Nora was restless and couldn't find peace. She pondered over what could have happened to her beloved. The woman waited a few more days and then went to the police to report her husband missing. The investigator questioned Nora in detail and told her it was too early to worry. If Gatir had gone away for work, it was possible that his phone had been stolen and he simply couldn't remember his wife's number to call her. The officer advised her to wait until the end of his work shift. Nora left the police station feeling down and headed to her friend's place to talk about Gatir. Margarita listened attentively as Nora recounted how her husband had left, and it was only then that Nora mentioned giving him money. Rita looked at her friend as if she were crazy and said, Say goodbye to your money, just like you did with your beloved. I don't believe his story about work. He was supposed to call you the next day to let you know he had arrived in the city and was fine. But he didn't do that, and here you are searching for him with the police. God, when will you get wiser? You are a mother of two children, but you don't have an ounce of sense. Rita, you don't understand. Gatir had the money, and something could have happened to him because of it. Well, don't worry. They'll find your beloved with some blonde-haired lady. Everything will be fine with Gatir. But let me ask you this, if he deceived you, will you forgive him again and accept him back as if nothing happened? Rita quietly asked her friend. I can't even imagine Gatir doing such a thing, so I can't answer your question, Nora sadly replied. Some time passed, and Nora received a call from the police, informing her that her husband was safe and living in the city. The woman was relieved that her husband was alright, but she couldn't understand why Gatir hadn't called her. She asked the same question to her friend. Margarita looked at Nora with a frown and said, He played you like a fiddle. He arrived here all affectionate and sweet, said a few tender words, and you melted. You still love him. That's how Gatir took advantage of your feelings. He asked for money and vanished. And on top of it all, he forgot to leave his mobile number. You have a cunning husband. To be honest, I'm even afraid to interact with such a person. Do you think Gatir deceived me? Nora asked barely audibly. I don't think, I'm sure. Just think about it, why hasn't he called you yet? And his work shift has already ended, so where on earth is he? Draw your own conclusions about this person. I understand that love is blind, you fall in love with anyone. But this is beyond belief, stealing money from your own wife and children. It's outrageous. Margarita exclaimed in anger. Nora returned home utterly exhausted. She didn't want to believe her friend's words, but the fact remained that Gatir was living comfortably in the city and wasn't in a hurry to make an appearance. The woman sat tiredly in the living room chair and burst into tears from the hurt, realizing that she was willing to do anything for Gatir. And he, it turns out, had used her once again. Several months passed, and Gatir never showed up or called. Nora no longer knew if she was waiting for her husband to return or not. She simply focused on work and her children. Her only goal now was to ensure that her son and daughter lacked nothing. 
And now, Constantino started attending elementary school. Nora was well aware that with each passing year, the expenses for the children were gradually increasing. Therefore, she decided that she would cultivate a garden during the summer, not partially as she had done before, but fully. Nora wanted to make more preserves to sell by the roadside on weekends. She had read about this idea in a newspaper. She shared her plans with her friend. As soon as Margarita learned about it, she immediately began scolding Nora, saying, What are you thinking? You already have a demanding job. And now you want to slave away in the garden? You don't think about yourself at all. Understand that you can't earn all the money in the world. Your children are dressed and shod just fine, so don't undermine your health like this. I don't want Constantino and Agueda to be dressed just fine. I want them to be dressed better than others. And I don't want anyone to pity me, thinking I'm a lonely woman barely making ends meet, Nora quietly replied. You know, I'm amazed by your way of thinking, honestly. By doing this, you'll spoil your children. Mark my words. Margarita said, secretly angry with her friend for not feeling sorry for herself. And then, summer arrived. On her days off, Nora devoted herself entirely to the garden. On this particular day, she was transplanting seedlings into the beds when she unexpectedly heard a male voice calling her name from behind the fence. Nora looked up and saw him, Gautier. The woman straightened up, stared intently at the man, who was smiling nonchalantly. Nora slowly approached the fence, nodded in greeting, and asked Gautier what he was doing in these parts. Her husband quietly replied that they needed to talk. Nora smiled in response and said, It seems to me that there was time for that, but it has already been missed, so we don't have much to talk about, Nora said barely audibly. Wait, let me explain why I did what I did. Maybe you'll understand me. You've always been the only one who truly understood me, honestly. Allow me to come into the yard, it's uncomfortable to stand here by the fence. And you're still my wife, after all. Her husband said, It's true that I am your lawful wife, but that's my mistake. On my next day off, I'll file for divorce. If you came here to ask for more money, I can tell you that I don't have any. So, what else could have brought you here? I don't even know. Just don't say it's love. I trusted you several times before, but recently everything has burned out completely, Nora calmly stated. Hold on a moment. Let's talk like civilized people. I won't argue that I deceived you. But I needed the money. I'll find a job and give you back that money. And now I came to you and our children. You are my family. I have no one else. My mother passed away last year, and I don't keep in touch with my brother. Tell me, where should I go in a difficult moment if not to my beloved wife? Gautier said, It's clear that Sandra threw you out again. I haven't even forgotten her name. And you decided to come to me for a while? Well, this house is now closed to you forever, Nora said. Where did you get the idea that I was with Sandra? I was living alone, Gautier gloomily replied. Stop lying already. The truth is that I was truly worried that something happened to you. Do you know that I went to the police? They told me that you were alive and well. But even knowing that I was looking for you, you didn't bother to make a single phone call. So, I decided to find out about you from that classmate of yours, the one you asked about me. And he told me that you're living with Sandra. Therefore, let's not make a circus out of this right now, as you like to say. Understand that I've grown up a bit and I can tell you one thing, you've left ruins in my heart. I won't hide that I still love you, but I firmly say that I won't live with you. It's easier for me to go through life alone, relying only on myself. And I think we shouldn't continue this conversation. For example, I have no desire, and I have work up to my neck. Unlike you, I earn my money through my own labor, not by stealing, Nora said, then turned around and walked towards the garden. Gautier called Nora several times, but she didn't turn back to him. Gautier stood there for a while, hoping that she would come back to him and let him in. However, Nora continued planting seedlings without looking back. Gautier spat angrily and walked away. 
Nora spent some more time tending to the garden before heading home, where her children were waiting for her. Nora patted their heads and told them she would warm up the food for dinner. After feeding her son and daughter, she called her friend and told her about Gautier's visit. Margarita listened silently without asking any extra questions. And when she heard that Nora had stood up to her husband, she genuinely rejoiced and said, I can't believe you did that, honestly. Gautier was like an untouchable figure for you, and now you turned him away at the gate. I can't even imagine the expression on his face when he heard your refusal. I don't know what his face looked like. Maybe I woke up from a long sleep. Right now, what's important to me is to file for divorce, and the rest doesn't matter. And also, I don't want Gautier to appear in my life anymore, Nora quietly replied. After the conversation with her friend, Nora involuntarily breathed a sigh of relief. She felt lighter in her soul. Nora realized that by standing up to her husband, she had released some invisible burden from her shoulders that had been weighing her down all this time. Nora truly hoped that her husband wouldn't come back anymore, but Gautier visited her a couple more times. He begged Nora to change her decision, mentioning that they had children together who needed a father. Nora calmly listened to Gautier and then stated in a steady voice that their journey together in life was over and there would be no going back. Deep down, Nora wanted this person to disappear from her horizon once and for all. After some time, Nora filed for divorce and she did it with a light heart. And when she received the divorce certificate, she offered to celebrate the occasion with her friend. Margarita gladly agreed. Days, months, and years flew by. Nora continued to work in the boiler room and devoted herself to her garden. On weekends, early in the morning, she would pack a bag of produce and ride her bicycle to the highway, where she would set up a stand to sell her products. Nora even had regular customers who would make arrangements with her for future purchases. Margarita saw how Nora tried her best to earn a living without sparing her own health. Her friend was angry that Nora didn't think about herself at all. Once, when Margarita visited Nora, she said again, Why are you the only one working in the garden? Look, Agueda is already 16 years old. And Constantino is not little either. Why don't you make them work? They are growing up as consumers at your expense. I can see that Agueda doesn't help you at all. And she's a girl. What will happen if you get sick? Who will have it easier then? Margarita exclaimed. Margarita, don't you understand? The children have been studying the whole year. They're tired of it. They need to recharge their energy during the summer, and I won't force them to toil and labor. Agueda and Constantino will have plenty of work to do in the future. Right now, let them enjoy a normal childhood, Nora replied. Nobody's saying you should rob them of their childhood. What I'm telling you is that they should also be introduced to work. Look at them, they take everything you do for granted. You are constantly in the boiler room, in the garden, or going to the highway with your produce. A couple of hours of work won't harm the children. I even make my son help me with household chores, Margarita insisted. It seems you enjoy coming here and lecturing me all the time. Let's change the subject. You raise your children your way, and I raise mine my way, the homeowner responded. When Agueda was in her final year of high school, Nora injured her back and spent a long time in the hospital. Margarita often visited her, bringing home-cooked meals. Whenever her friend came, Nora would ask if she had been to their house. Trying to contain her irritation, Margarita would answer that she had. Nora would then ask how the children were doing. Her friend couldn't hold back and said, Tell me, do your son and daughter never call you? Why do you keep asking me all the time? I called Agueda several times, but she always says she's busy and doesn't have time to chat. I also tried calling Constantino, but he responds the same way as his sister. I'm just worried that they don't have enough to eat at home. After all, I'm not there with them, Nora sadly replied. Your Agueda should spend less time flirting with boys and focus more on her studies. I was at your house yesterday. And what did I see? Agueda wasn't there, 
but Constantino brought a whole gang of boys and caused a ruckus. I had to scold him. And that rascal even had the audacity to be rude to me. I barely restrained myself from giving him a spanking. Don't take offense, my friend, but I'm telling it like it is, Margarita said. Constantino is going through adolescence right now. He's 13, so we need to understand teenagers. And you're only ready to resort to spanking. With your approach to parenting, you can turn a child into a moral monster, Nora said. Could you say anything more foolish? We'll either have a falling out right now, or something else will happen. Margarita responded irritably. Soon, Nora was discharged from the hospital. She took unpaid leave from work to fully recover. Agueda didn't welcome her mother's decision and expressed it directly. Nora looked at her daughter in disbelief and sharply said, Have you not considered that if I continue working like this, I won't be able to work at all later? And then we won't be able to buy you all sorts of lipsticks and other trivial things. And you won't be able to flaunt around like before. Then I'll marry a rich man and solve the money problem that way. It's easy to find a guy with a fat wallet nowadays as long as I maintain my figure and have a doll-like face. And I have all that, so I won't be broke like some people, Agueda said in a whimsical tone. Well, well, we'll see how you live, the mother replied. After that conversation with her daughter, Nora was left with an unpleasant feeling. She made a vow to herself that she would talk more with her daughter about such topics. After some time, Nora returned to work. She resumed her familiar routine, working tirelessly. She didn't complain about having to work so much. She believed that if she gave her children life, she was obligated to give them the very best. When Agueda was nearing the end of her studies in high school, Gautier reappeared in Nora's life. Nora looked at her ex-husband and couldn't understand what he wanted from her this time. After all, he had been absent for so many years. Meanwhile, Gautier expressed his desire to reconnect with the children. Nora shrugged and said that he should ask Agueda and Constantino if they wanted to have any contact. Gautier requested permission to enter the house, but Nora made it clear that she wouldn't let him inside. Just then, Agueda approached them, looking puzzled at the unfamiliar man. Nora smiled at her daughter and said, Agueda, allow me to introduce you to your father. The young woman now looked at the man with disdain and haughtily asked what he wanted. Gautier wanted to embrace his daughter in a paternal manner, but she pushed him away with disgust and said, Don't you dare touch me with your hands. What do you want here? For example, I was perfectly fine without a daddy. If you suddenly remembered that you have a daughter, you can forget about it right away. It will be easier for everyone. What nonsense are you talking about? I am your father, and I had substantial reasons for my absence. I was serving a prison sentence and was recently released, and I came straight to you all, Gautier said. Well, I don't care where you've been. You and mom are a perfect match. Daddy doesn't pay child support, and mom refuses to ask for alimony out of pride, Agueda rudely replied. Nora didn't expect such a response from her daughter and was momentarily taken aback. Then, in a raised voice, she asked Agueda to watch her tongue. The young girl lifted her head and headed into the house. Gautier just smirked at his daughter's reaction and said aloud, You have raised the children poorly if your own daughter speaks about her own mother that way. I wonder what Constantino will say when we meet. For heaven's sake, leave, Gautier. There's no place for you here. I don't think our son will be happy to see a father who abandoned him as a baby. I'm simply asking you to disappear from my life. I don't interfere with your life, so don't interfere with mine. Nora said emotionally. And what about your love for me? I remember you mentioned it during our last conversation, Gautier sarcastically remarked. That was a long time ago. It's all forgotten, and nothing can bring it back. Now, all I dream of is for you to leave. I don't think I've done anything wrong to you. Act like a man this time and just go, the homeowner said barely audibly. Fine, I won't bother you anymore. Forgive me for everything, the man said and then turned sharply and walked away. After Gautier's visit, he truly didn't appear in his ex-wife's life anymore. 
Nora entered the house after his departure and immediately addressed her daughter. The mother instructed Agueda to explain her behavior on the street. The young woman arrogantly told her mother that she said what she truly thought. Nora approached her daughter and asked quietly, Yes, I intentionally didn't pursue child support from Gutierrez through legal means because I believe that if a person wants to help their children, they should express that desire rather than being forced. In this case, your father didn't want to help you, and I had no intention of coercing him. Don't blame me for that. Everyone has their own principles. After that brief conversation with her daughter, Nora noticed that her relationship with Agueda had become strained. If before, when her mother asked her to do something around the house, Agueda, although not always, would fulfill the request. But now, she seemed to be resistant to everything. Nora couldn't understand why she couldn't find common ground with her daughter. She called her friend and told her about the problem. Margarita listened to her friend and then said that Nora herself was to blame for Agueda's behavior. Nora interrupted her and asked for help in understanding the situation rather than assigning blame. Margarita immediately realized that her friend was genuinely concerned about her relationship with Agueda. So she said, Let me try talking to her. Maybe I can handle it better. I won't sugarcoat things. I'll tell her how it is in reality. Hold on, this is just the beginning. The real conversation will come later. In the meantime, be stricter with your son. Once again, you are blaming me for everything. Haven't you considered that I had to be both a mother and a father to my children? And I had to work hard for all three of us so my children wouldn't be deprived. Nora said, almost in tears. All right, don't cry. I'll talk to Agueda. Not today, I can't promise that, but definitely tomorrow. And let's not lose heart, we'll get through this. Her friend replied. Margarita met with Agueda and without any preamble asked her why she was being so rude to her mother. Agueda arrogantly stated that she had no intention of discussing such matters with strangers. Margarita looked at the young woman in surprise and then indignantly asked who she considered a stranger. Agueda provocatively looked at Margarita and said, What's not to understand? Of course, it's you, Aunt Margarita. I see you consider yourself all grown up if you're saying such things to me. But don't forget that I used to wipe your and your brother's snot when you were little. Look at how you've started talking now. I'm not your mother. I won't be polite. I'll make your pretty face look ugly in an instant. And all your bravado will vanish. Margarita said angrily, barely restraining herself from slapping her daughter's friend. Agueda stood there in that moment, looking mockingly at her mother's friend. She didn't say anything. She was curious about what Margarita would do next. The woman seemed to understand that Agueda was deliberately testing her patience and spoke sternly. I don't know what you're trying to achieve, but remember that I will turn your life into hell if you continue mistreating your mother. Your mother is exhausting herself with work for you and Constantino, and this is how you repay her? You're not a little child anymore, and you should understand that you're setting a terrible example for your brother in how to treat your mother. I strongly urge you to reconsider your behavior. I won't tell your mother about our conversation, and it would be best if you didn't either, although the choice is yours. Margarita didn't know if her words had reached Agueda but she genuinely wanted Agueda to at least grasp the fact that she shouldn't treat her mother like that. The woman sincerely believed that after this conversation, Agueda wouldn't openly disrespect her mother anymore. However, after the conversation with Margarita, Agueda harbored resentment towards her mother. She believed that it was her mother who had asked her friend to have such a stern conversation with her. Agueda became more subdued after the conversation but tried to avoid interaction with her mother. Nora tried to regain her daughter's affection. She could see that Agueda wasn't being rude, but at the same time, she acted distant. The school year flew by, and Agueda was preparing to leave for the city to attend college. Before her departure, Nora asked her daughter to be vigilant and not lose herself. Agueda listened to her mother's advice with complete indifference, and before boarding the bus, she said to her mother, I'm so glad I'm leaving this place. Everything here feels dull, and I'll try my best never to return. 
What about me, my dear? Won't you miss me at all? Nora said, feeling lost. I don't know. Right now, I just want to escape from here and live according to my own rules, without anyone telling me what to do and imposing their policies on me. Agueda replied briskly. After that, Agueda didn't let her mother say anything else. She quickly kissed her mother on the cheek and hurried towards the bus. Nora silently wiped away her tears and wished her daughter a safe journey. She hoped that Agueda would find her happiness and that she would visit her soon. A month passed since Nora's daughter left. Nora called Agueda every two days, but her daughter would only give short, curt responses, assuring her that everything was fine. Nora found these brief answers unsatisfying. She wanted to know all the details. However, Agueda would say a few words and then quickly end the conversation. A year went by since Agueda's departure. During this time, only Nora called her daughter. She was deeply concerned about Agueda's well-being. Margarita could see that her friend was tormented by this situation and tried her best to support her. Then, Agueda herself called her mother and announced that she was getting married. Nora didn't know how to react to this news and simply asked her daughter, Sweetie, are you really sure about this decision? You know that it's a serious step and I want to be sure that you're making the right choice. Your father and I couldn't handle our differences and I didn't want you to end up in the same situation. Love? Don't make me laugh. It's all about money for me. He's ready to do anything for me. The only thing that bothers me is that he insists on asking for my hand from you. I tried to convince him otherwise, but Marcelo, that's his name, wouldn't budge. So, you'll have to meet us, and I ask that you don't embarrass me. Agueda spoke irritably. Nora felt both relieved and bitter after this phone call. She was happy that her daughter called on her own, but she was saddened by the fact that Agueda was getting married without love. Nora missed her daughter dearly and decided to talk to her about the marriage when she returned home. Soon, Agueda arrived in the village with her fiancé in an expensive white car. In honor of the occasion, Nora prepared a duck stuffed with mushrooms and potatoes and baked a cake. She invited her friend and her friend's husband with their child to join them on this day. As soon as Agueda entered the house, she critically surveyed the table and frowned slightly, which didn't go unnoticed by Margarita. Marcelo, on the other hand, appreciated the festive table and immediately praised Nora for her culinary skills. Nora was flattered by the young man's compliment. The introduction went well, except for Agueda's whispered remark to her mother that the dishes were meager and she was embarrassed in front of her fiancé. Nora was overwhelmed by her daughter's comment and barely held back her tears. The hostess of the house was reassured by Margarita, who asked her not to pay attention to Agueda's words. Soon, Marcelo took the floor and addressed Nora. I want to marry your daughter and seek your blessing for our union. What is your answer? What can I say? It all depends on Agueda. If she loves you, young man, then I wish you both happiness. Nora replied with a smile, liking the young man. Of course, I agree. If I was against it, I wouldn't be here. Agueda spoke. A couple of days later, Marcelo and his bride-to-be were preparing to leave, and Agueda asked her mother not to attend the wedding. Nora looked at her daughter in disbelief and asked why she was making such a strange request. Agueda honestly replied that there would be important people present at the celebration. Nora was even more surprised and asked, Who are these important people that I shouldn't be there? We've always been close, and I want to share the joy of this day with you. Do you really want to exclude me from this significant event? Agueda frowned and sharply replied, There's no need for me to list who will be at the wedding. Just do as I ask, and let's not make a big deal out of it. Nora felt a lump in her throat after her daughter's words. She struggled to swallow and nodded in agreement to Agueda's request. Marcelo, on the other hand, enthusiastically invited Nora to visit them and, of course, to attend the wedding ceremony. As soon as Agueda left with her fiancé, Nora finally allowed herself to cry. It was incredibly painful for her that her own daughter was ashamed of her. Not only that, 
but Agueda explicitly asked her not to come to the wedding. Nora was too embarrassed to even mention it to her friend. And when she received the wedding invitation, she called her daughter and said that she couldn't attend due to feeling unwell. Nora knew that her daughter understood her excuse since Agueda had asked for it. However, when Marcelo took the phone, Nora felt uncomfortable with her lie. In a worried tone, the young man said, What illness do you have? We can postpone the wedding day. I really would love to see you on that day. Marcelo, don't worry, my dear. I'll come to visit you when I feel a bit better. But postponing the celebration is a bad omen. You'll still capture it on video, and I'll watch you both, the young ones, Nora said through tears. Are you absolutely sure you won't be able to come? The man asked anxiously. Nora reassured the young man that she would visit them later, but asked him not to postpone the wedding ceremony. Constantino, who overheard the conversation, said that he felt fine and wanted to attend the celebration. Nora called her daughter again and asked if it would be okay for her brother to come to the wedding. Agueda thought for a while and then answered, let him come. On the eve of the wedding, Margarita asked Nora how she was feeling since Agueda was getting married for the first time. Nora replied that she was genuinely happy for her daughter and wished her nothing but happiness. Margarita sensed a hint of sadness in her friend's words and sternly commanded, Don't tell me stories and just tell me what is wrong with you again. I can feel that it's about Agueda. I didn't want to tell you because I know you're a hot-headed person who can make things worse. I'm just begging you to listen to me and not take any action. If you do things your way, I swear, we'll stop talking to each other. Nora said. All right, now tell me. Margarita responded. Nora told her friend that her daughter had asked her not to come to the wedding. She spoke to her friend, barely holding back her tears. Margarita could see how emotionally challenging it was for Nora at that moment, and she sincerely sympathized with her. After Nora finished her narrative, her friend exclaimed indignantly, What a shameless Agueda! I'm sorry, my friend, for speaking like this about your daughter, but this is going too far. To be ashamed of her own mother. It's disgraceful. Did she grow up in another village? Ah, uh, I shouldn't have given you my word that I wouldn't intervene in this situation. I would call Agueda right now and give her a good scolding. But don't be sad. Your daughter will realize her mistake, but it will be too late. And so, the wedding took place. On that day, Nora tried to think about everything except the fact that her daughter was getting married in a white dress. It was unbearably painful and hurtful for her that her daughter had treated her this way. She tried to put herself in Agueda's shoes, but couldn't, as she couldn't tell her mother that she was ashamed of her. Time slowly passed, and Constantino was graduating from high school, while Agueda had her first child, a son named Tin. Nora was glad that everything was going well for her daughter. However, two things bothered her. First, Agueda refused to visit her with her grandchild under any pretext. Second, Constantino started skipping school and often found himself in unpleasant situations. He would steal motorcycles, get into fights with classmates, and get into other troubles. Nora had to compensate for all of this with money. Margarita knew about Constantino's misbehavior and how it caused problems for his mother. To support her friend, Margarita often said, I can't wait for Constantino to finish school and join the army. There, for sure, all the nonsense will get out of him, and he will become a real man. And you will be proud of your son. For now, you just have to be patient. There's simply no other way. So be strong and don't lose hope. After finishing school, Constantino didn't enroll anywhere and waited for his conscription into the army. He served his military service and then didn't return to the village. He went to the city where his sister lived and found a job there. Nora was deeply concerned that all her children had left their hometown and left her alone. Several years passed. During this time, Constantino got married but soon divorced. Agueda lived with her husband. Only Constantino visited his mother once, and his purpose was to have her sign over the house to him. 
Nora told Constantino that it was too early to think about that because she planned to live a while longer. She added that if she were to leave the house in her will, it would be divided equally between both her children. Upon hearing his mother's response, Constantino quickly left the village. Soon after, the woman found herself in the hospital with a back problem and was granted a disability status. She was no longer able to lift heavy objects and experienced excruciating pain in her lower back, making it difficult for her to walk. Nora felt useless in this life and hated herself for it. However, she didn't tell anyone about it. She would only cry bitterly in the evenings, burying her face in the pillow. Margarita was aware of her friend's illness and saw how difficult it was for her to manage even the simplest household tasks. Margarita suggested calling the children to help Nora adapt during the initial period. However, Nora refused this suggestion. After the conversation with her friend, Margarita coincidentally ran into Nora's neighbor, Leonila, and struck up a conversation with her. Leonila mentioned that she often heard Nora crying because she couldn't handle simple household chores like fetching water or taking out the trash. Margarita spent a long time talking to the neighbor, discussing how they could help Nora. Leonila said she would occasionally drop by to assist, but she couldn't be there all the time as she had her own family. Margarita thanked the neighbor for not forgetting about her friend and, at the same time, contemplated how she could help Nora. After the conversation with Leonila, Margarita realized that her friend genuinely needed assistance. She would have helped her herself, but now she also had her two-year-old grandson to take care of while his mother was in the hospital. That's when Margarita decided to talk to her friend and suggested calling the children for help. But as soon as Nora heard this, she immediately asked her friend to forget about the suggestion. Margarita looked at her friend in astonishment and asked why she refused. Nora replied that she didn't want to become a burden to anyone, especially not to her children. After the conversation with her friend, Margarita searched for a solution on how to help her. She came to the conclusion that she needed to call Nora's children without Nora's knowledge. First, she called Agueda and spoke to her sternly. Your mother is in a difficult situation. She needs help. Come urgently. And don't tell me you have urgent matters to attend to. If I don't see you within three days, I'll call your husband. At least he treats your mother much better than you do. And you know very well that I will do it. After that, Margarita called Nora's son with the same demanding tone and asked him to come. Constantino initially cited his busy schedule, but Margarita threatened him with trouble at work, specifically by telling them how he abandoned his mother in a difficult moment. In response, Constantino reluctantly agreed and said he would come within a week. Soon after Margarita's call, both siblings arrived in the village. When Nora saw her children, she was overjoyed. At that moment, she had no idea it was all thanks to her friend. She was just happy that her daughter and son had come to visit her. However, the joy was short-lived as she overheard a conversation between the children in the kitchen. Agueda initiated the dialogue, saying, Do you think I'm planning to stay here for long? It wouldn't hurt to make some extra money from selling the house, but I have no intention of taking care of our mother. And if it weren't for Aunt Margarita's call, I wouldn't even be here. She told me she would inform my husband that I abandoned my mother. And my husband is the epitome of kindness towards the elderly. I just don't understand why he respects her, to be honest. Aunt Rita called me too, promising a lot of trouble. You know her temperament. If she said something, she will definitely follow through. Sometimes, I even hate mom's friend, Constantino whispered. What are we going to do with you next? Agueda asked. Listen, having some extra capital wouldn't hurt either of us. And you know our mother won't complain. She'll probably go to the store soon for bread or milk, and that's when we'll throw her belongings out of the house. Then we'll claim that she's mentally unstable and needs to be admitted to a psychiatric hospital. And after that, we'll get the property, or rather, the money from its sale, Constantino enthusiastically suggested. Not a bad idea, but you'll have to handle all the disputes with Margarita, Agueda whispered. Nora heard the entire conversation and was petrified with horror. Is that all her children wanted to do? Just to get an equal share from selling the house? 
She couldn't understand how her children could speak so cynically about their own mother. Nora quietly walked to her room and called her friend, briefly explaining her children's plan. Margarita, struggling to contain her anger, asked what Nora planned to do. Nora remained silent for a while and then said, I have a plan, but I need help. If you can, I'm waiting for you to visit me right now. Margarita rushed over within an hour, and Nora expressed her desire to transfer the house to a facility that would take care of her. She decided to inform her children about it at the last moment. Margarita initially tried to protect her friend from taking this step and suggested that Nora move in with them. In response, Nora smiled and said, I already owe you so much, but I have to decline your offer. I don't want to burden you. Understand that you have your own life, and I have mine. Besides, you've always wanted me to make something of myself. Well, now I have a chance to do that in a new place. Perhaps in the retirement home, I'll meet a partner with whom I can spend the rest of my days. Nora Fernandez paused in her story, wiped her eyes with a handkerchief, and looked at her visitor. Elvira Velasco, who was listening attentively, sat with a thoughtful gaze. As soon as the elderly woman fell silent, Elvira asked, Why aren't you continuing with the story? I'm fully engaged. What else do you want to know when everything is already clear? The old woman replied softly, Not everything. I understand that you called a notary and bequeathed your house to us, to the retirement home. But how did you inform your children about it? You interrupted your narrative at the most interesting part, said Elvira Velasco, who was the director of the retirement home. It's very simple. Later, my friend and I visited your retirement home, and I really liked it there. Granted, we didn't get a chance to speak with you, as you mentioned earlier. But nonetheless, it felt very cozy. So I told my friend that I wanted to spend the remaining years of my life right here. And then we secretly invited the notary to Margarita's house. It was done deliberately so that my children wouldn't find out. And we drew up the will, transferring my property into your ownership. The next day, my neighbor and Margarita came to visit me and suggested going to the store for a walk as if it were a casual outing. Naturally, I agreed. And before leaving, I asked my children if they had gathered my things to take outside while I went to buy bread. The reaction from my daughter and son was astonishing. They were frozen in shock. Meanwhile, I calmly continued to speak, giving them one hour to collect and move my belongings to the yard. It was only then that my daughter regained her senses and started to assure me that I was delusional. I listened calmly to Agueda's accusatory speech and only after that informed them that the house already belonged to the retirement home for the elderly. You should have seen the faces of my children at that moment. Then they started screaming that I had no right to do such a thing. And it gets even more interesting. My children accused me of being mentally unstable, and they said they would challenge my will. Fortunately, I wasn't alone at that moment, and my neighbor and friend heard every outcry from my children. Afterwards, something unusual happened. Agueda started calling her husband and telling him that I had lost my mind. She said a lot of unpleasant things about me, but she's still my daughter, and I won't speak ill of her. After shedding these tears, Nora Fernandez cried again. The elderly woman wiped her eyes with a handkerchief and looked at her visitor. The guest could see that the old woman was studying her attentively. At that moment, the director of the retirement home struggled to find the words she wanted to say. Meanwhile, Sonora Fernandez managed a forced smile and spoke. I must have shocked you with my story or perhaps wearied you. But I spoke the truth as it happened, without any exaggeration. And believe me, recounting it wasn't easy for me. As I was speaking to you, I relived everything as if it had happened to me again. I listened to you attentively. You simply astonished me with your story. And honestly, I understand how difficult it was for you to talk about it all. You loved your husband so much and were willing to do anything for him. Even after his repeated betrayals, you remained kind towards him. And then another blow in your life when your daughter started conflicting with you. And what happened at the end of the story was truly shocking to me. You did everything for your children, and they were willing to treat you that way. 
but I have no right to judge anyone here because it's your life and only you can pass judgment, the guest replied. After that, the two women fell silent. Each of them was lost in her own thoughts. At that moment, there was a knock at the door. Nora Fernandez stood up to open it and saw her neighbor at the threshold, carrying a pie with fish. The host smiled and greeted Leonila, inviting her inside. The neighbor entered and noticed that Sonora Fernandez wasn't alone. She said, It seems I came at the wrong time, but I just wanted to stop by for a moment and offer you a taste of the pie. My husband caught some fish yesterday, so I decided to treat my household with a homemade pastry and thought of sharing it with my neighbor as well. Come in, Leonila. I'm always happy to see you. By the way, let me introduce you. This is Elvira Velasco. I'm planning to move to her retirement home in the near future, Nora Fernandez said and then turned to the director, saying, And this is my neighbor, Leonila. Thanks to her, the whole neighborhood now applauds and marvels at how well I discipline my children. She's a wonderful person who has often helped me in difficult times. And now I'll say something important. What I did wasn't for revenge. It was to make my children reflect on whether they're doing everything right in life. I hope my son and daughter learn some lessons from all of this. But regardless, I have no regrets about my actions. As they say, everything happens for the best. And that applies to my situation as well. At that moment, the front door opened and Margarita appeared on the threshold, holding her grandchild in her arms. She glanced attentively at everyone present and greeted them all with a cheerful voice. I've come to help you pack your things. Who knows, you might forget something valuable if I'm not here. I don't want to keep running back and forth to your place every other day. You never miss an opportunity for a sharp remark, do you? Nora laughed in response. All right, let's get down to business. We don't have much time left until you move to your new residence, Margarita said warmly. Elvira Velasco observed with a smile as the two friends conversed. The guest understood that these two women had a genuine friendship that had endured over the years. Elvira Velasco snapped out of her thoughts and offered her help in packing. Sonora Fernandez gladly accepted and Leonila joined them as well. All the women worked together, guided by Nora. They shared funny anecdotes from their lives along the way. Time flew by, and Elvira was getting ready to leave. She hugged Nora goodbye and said, I'm not bidding you farewell for long. We'll see each other very soon and have much more to talk about. And I must say, you have an exceptional friend and a wonderful neighbor. As for your children, they're still young. Wishing you all the best, and until we meet again, after some time, Nora Fernandez moved to live in the retirement home. The elderly woman quickly found like-minded companions and made friends there. Nora had conversations with Elvira about life, culture, and music. She had been living in the retirement home for about a month and hadn't regretted her decision to settle there once. Everything suited her, from the food to the social interactions. Nora now cherished each day and didn't dwell on the negatives. The elderly woman was occasionally visited by her friend who brought her treats from home. Nora would grumble at her friend for lugging heavy jars at her age. And Margarita, in turn, laughed at her friend, saying, Look at you, not only have you settled in, but you've also become bold. Watch out, if I start envying you, I might just divorce my husband and move in with you here. Don't you dare do that, or who will bring me homemade food then? Nora replied, laughing. And now Nora put on a serious expression and looked attentively at her friend. Margarita immediately sensed the change in her friend's mood and said anxiously, What happened? You know I won't rest until I find out the truth. Do you know how my children are doing? My heart aches for them, Nora murmured hoarsely. Don't worry, if something were wrong, they would have come to see you long ago. Or to me. Besides, Agueda and Constantino know where you are, Margarita gently reassured her friend. Two months passed since Nora had been living in the retirement home. Unexpectedly, an event occurred in her life that she had never anticipated. 
The elderly woman met a man of her own age in the retirement home. His name was Crespo. Initially, they had simple conversations, discussing various topics. After some time, Nora realized that she was attracted to this man. And soon, Crespo proposed marriage to her. Nora couldn't believe that at this stage of her life, she could love wholeheartedly again. But it happened, and the elderly woman accepted his proposal. Nora informed her friend of this over the phone, and her friend remained silent in astonishment for a while before exclaiming joyfully, Congratulations! But I have to lay my eyes on your chosen one, just in case he doesn't pass my face control and I'll have to reject him. You're incorrigible. Nora replied, laughing. You know, I'm increasingly inclined to move into your retirement home. It seems like life there is simply fantastic. Margarita playfully responded. When Elvira learned about the upcoming marriage, she invited Nora to her office for a conversation. She addressed the elderly woman. I've heard that changes are coming to your life. Congratulations, which I say with great joy. You and Crespo make a wonderful couple. Now I want to tell you something. Your house hasn't been sold yet. As a wedding gift, the retirement home would like to present it to you. The choice is yours. And also, if you're worried about the legality of it, rest assured, we have the right to refuse the bequest and you can nullify it. Can I discuss it with my future husband? After all, he will be the head of the family now, Nora replied with a smile. Of course, Elvira replied. The marriage with her beloved was not the last joyful event in Nora's life. On the day she exchanged wedding rings with Crespo, she saw her daughter, son-in-law, and grandchild looking embarrassed while Constantino stood nearby. Nora shed tears of joy when she saw her children, and her daughter rushed to her with tears in her eyes, whispering softly, Forgive me, my dear, if you can, I've done a lot of terrible things, and I feel so guilty before you, her daughter whispered, tears welling up in her eyes. At that moment, Nora's son approached her, holding a bouquet of flowers, and then dropped to one knee, asking for forgiveness. The elderly woman couldn't believe that both of her children were here, asking for forgiveness. Nora looked over her son's head and saw her friend's satisfied face, realizing that Margarita had a hand in this. And then there was a celebration in the retirement home's dining hall. The elderly couple received heartfelt congratulations, and everyone wished them a life of peace and harmony. Nora was doubly happy on this day because her beloved partner and children were by her side. After the celebration, Nora called her friend aside and said to her in private, You know, I have to confess that you are the truest and best friend I have ever had. There won't be anyone like you in my life anymore. I know that my children didn't appear at the wedding just by chance. It's all thanks to you. You have helped me countless times. Thank you so much for everything. I don't even know how to repay you, honestly, Nora said, tears streaming down her face. Margarita responded, Let's skip the tears, shall we? Don't forget that we've been friends since our school days, and the most important thing is that we trust each other. Now let's talk about our plans for a happy life. That's much more exciting. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.